All right, so this morning we're starting a, a very brief series, just a few sermons. But what I want to do is I want to introduce into our church something that um, I want us to embrace every week as a reminder a constant and continual reminder to ourselves of, of who we are as followers of Jesus. And so what I want to do um, over the next few weeks is to introduce this and, and, and then just you know, keep it before, something that we remind ourselves of every week. Uh, and, and the way I'm going to do that, what I want to do is introduce a very brief Cottondale, what I call Cottondale Catechism. Do you all know what a catechism is? you know what a catechism is? Catechism is a very it's ancient teaching technique. Um, ca- you know, there, there's the, the the Catholic Church has an official Catholic catechism, which is where the where their official teaching is is stored. A large part of their official teaching is stored. Uh, so churches throughout the millennia or the you know centuries have been using catechism in the in the Protestant you know the non-Catholic world. Probably the most famous catechism is the Westminster. The Westminster Catechism, they have a larger catechism and a shorter catechism. But what a catechism is, it's a set of questions and answers. That's all it is. It's a question and an answer, and it's meant to be memorized, right? Because you ask the question, and then you have the answer, so you memorize the question and the answer. So if someone asks you the question, you immediately know the answer. And what is that? It means you have learned the answer to these questions, right? So it's a teaching tool, okay? It's, It's a catechism. Historically... Historically, catechisms have been very important in the ministry of the church, but have fallen into unuse uh, uh, among most modern churches, okay? Um, But it's a way to answer the most important questions. It's a way to teach people how to answer the most important questions about life and about faith. So, for example, in the Westminster Catechism, probably the most famous question and answer uh, in the Protestant world is question number one. Of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question number one of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is this. What is the chief end of man? Now, now think about that. What does that mean? So this is the very first question in the catechism. What is the chief end of man? The, that question is asking what? what? Why does man exist? Why are we here? What's, what's the purpose that we exist as human beings? If you think about it, that's kind of an important question. Why do we even exist? Why am I alive? Why did God make me? What is my purpose for being here on the earth? Don't you think it would be important to know the answer to that question? A catechism is a tool to teach us the answer to that question. And the answer of question number one in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, why, uh, what is the chief end of man? It is this. Uh, The chief end of man is to... Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's the answer. That's a good answer. We exist to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You see, lots of people miss that second part. We, we miss that the things that we delight in the most, we automatically glorify. C.S. Lewis taught that, right? If you got something that you love... What do you, what do you, that, that means so much to you and you love it and it brings you joy. What do you do about it? You tell other people about it. You show it. You say, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you heard about this? Hey, let me show you this. You can't help but take, you can't help but talk about it. You can't help but glorify it because you enjoy it. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why we exist. There's no greater joy than knowing God. So I'm going to introduce a a brief Cottondale Catechism, and um, it's going to be super simple. It's going to be it's going to be so simple to remind ourselves of who we are and what what we were made to do. It's so simple a caveman can do it. No, no offense. (laughs) All you cavemen's in here, my apology. Okay, it's so simple. It's almost too simple, and this is. So the first question, question number one of the, of the Cottondale Shorter Catechism, because it's super short. Whose are we? Answer. 
we are Christ's. Let's practice. Whose are we? We are Christ's. Whose are we? We are Christ's. Whose are we? We are Christ's. What I want to do today is those three words, as simple as they are, I think if we grasp what it means to belong to Christ, those three words will seem like a lot more than just three words to us. I believe that when we say that, every time we say that, our heart can just become full and overflowing with glory and joy about what it means to belong to Jesus. And so what I want to do today is... Whose are we? We are Christ. I want to fill in that concept. I want to fill in your heart and in your mind what it means to belong to Jesus so that every time in the future when I ask, whose are we? And we say, we are Christ. A whole, a whole glorious reality just sits in your heart. It just fills your mind when you say those three words. We are Christ. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is we talk about whose are we. And I'm going to begin in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, you could turn there and just go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read this passage um, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. This is what it says. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The word of God. You may be seated. Okay. Whose are we? We are Christ. We are Christ. I want to look at this from Galatians chapter 3, as we just talked about. In, in this passage, it, Paul says... That we, in verse 26, it says, In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Sons of God through faith. Okay? So faith, and then it goes on to say, um, For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay? There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? So Paul has this concept. Paul has this concept of being in Jesus. Okay, this is a hugely important concept, all right? And the, and, and the, whole, the whole thing is tied together, and the whole mechanism is, that God designed is built around faith. Faith is the mechanism that God uses us to put us in Christ, and in Christ we receive all the blessings of God. So, so he, Paul says we're all sons of God through faith. So through faith, God makes us sons, children of God. Okay, and you know, and if you're if you're a woman, don't let the son language put you off, right? The 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 I think I think what Paul is drawing on is the is the is the cultural background where it is it is only the sons at this time who receive an inheritance. But what is Paul trying to say? Paul is trying to say that everybody, male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, if you believe in Jesus, that faith. God sees that faith, and through faith, you become a child of God. You become in Christ, and by virtue of being in Christ and being a child of God, you now become an heir of God, an inheritor of all the riches and the blessings of God, and that is all possible through faith in Christ. He says, he says, In verse 27, as many of you were baptized into Christ has put on Christ. So notice all the language. Believing in Christ, being in Christ, putting on Christ. Everything is about Jesus, right? Everything's about Christ. When we believe in him, we become in him. We it's like we put him on. Jesus is God's beloved son. 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When you put on Jesus, when you put on Jesus, God now looks at you and says, that is my beloved son. That is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Why? Because you're great? No, because Christ is great. And you have put him on by faith. You've put him on and God sees you through Christ whom you have trusted in and put on and are now in. It's such important language. Jesus and the story of the Bible is what? It's, it's humanity failing over and over and over again to be who God has called them to be and unable to obtain the promises and the blessing of God because we're unable to to hold up our end of the deal, our, the, what we owe to God, what God deserves from us. But what did God do? He sent his son, the God-man, born of a virgin, to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. That is, live the perfect life. Live a perfectly righteous, sinless life. And so Jesus, of all people and all humanity who ever lived, Jesus is the only one who has actually obtained, achieved the promises, the blessings of God. And he achieved them for us so that through faith, even though we don't deserve them, through faith in Christ, we're united with Christ. All the blessings of God pour on Christ because Christ has achieved and earned them. And since they pour on Christ, they pour on us. Because we are in him through faith. So when we put on Jesus, we too receive all the promised blessings of God. And that's, that's what essentially, that's what, that's what he's saying. Jew, Greek, doesn't matter. Slave, free, it doesn't matter. Male or female, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter where you were born. doesn't matter the color of your skin. doesn't matter the language you speak. doesn't matter your social status in life. doesn't matter your gender, which there are only two genders, but it doesn't matter which one. The only thing that matters is Christ. If you are in Christ, you are an heir of all the promises of God. So the first the first and main point here is that to belong to Christ is to be a child of God. That's the key. If you belong to Christ, you are a child of God. Whose are we? We are Christ's. We are Christ's. And since we are Christ's, we are children of God. That's what the Bible says. We are Christ, and because we are Christ, we are children of God. So number one, to belong to Christ is to be a child of God. Number two, what I want to do now is I want to feel that out. What does it mean to be a child of God? What are the benefits of being a child of God? When we say we are Christ, what, what are the riches of what that means? That's what I want to talk about. The benefits of being a child of God. We can look right back in our main passage here in Galatians chapter 3. And if you just look uh, a few verses prior to that which we read back in Galatians 3 verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, so that In Christ Jesus, don't miss the language, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And so notice here, so uh, Galatians was like one of the first books I preached through way back. So if you remember like, Paul is dealing, the the major issue in the early church was like, how could Gentiles be saved? And that may sound weird to us because we're Gentiles, but but the, the, the whole Old Testament is about Jews. The Jews, God chose Abraham. He didn't choose anybody else. He chose Abraham and promised, made the promise to Abraham and to his offspring. And so the Jews were wondering, how in the world is it that Gentiles can get in on the promises of God without becoming a Jew? And, that, and that's the whole point is what Paul says is that's the whole point of Galatians. Is Paul saying, how is that possible? Through Christ. That's how it's possible. Christ came and fulfilled the law, which neither Jew nor Gentile could keep. 
and Christ fulfilled it, satisfying its demands so that now through faith in Christ, we, are, we become part of the people of God, not through law keeping, but through faith believing as a gift of God in his son who did what we couldn't do for ourselves. So that's what, so that's what the whole book of Galatians is about. And so, so look at what Paul is saying here. This is it's really profound, in fact. He talks about, he says that through Christ, the blessing of Abraham, because that's all the Jews cared about, right? Right? Uh, John the Baptist rebuked the Jews because they said, don't, presu- don't say to yourself, hey, I'm, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm good to go. And, and, and what did John the Baptist say? Hey, God could raise up a children of Abraham from these rocks. It doesn't mean you're good, right? But... But what, is, but what does that tell us about Abraham, right? Uh, Paul refers, verse 14, he says, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So now the, that, that's certainly referring to the blessing of Abraham is referring to the promises that God made to Abraham, right? So the promises that God made to Abraham are essentially some of the most important promises in the Bible, right? I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be, and I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And I will multiply your offspring and I'll give you this land. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? And the whole, literally the whole rest of the Bible from Genesis 12 on is God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. But what we see is that the the people of Abraham were essentially become a type and a picture of the, of the, the new covenant people of God in Jesus. Okay? But so in other words, so in other words, what 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 Paul is saying, and this is this is kind of a theological profundity here that Paul can say by the wisdom and revelation of the Holy Spirit, he is saying that the promise that God gave Abraham was ultimately pointing to the promise of the Holy Spirit. Because what happens when Christ has come and pours out his spirit and you believe in Christ, guess what? You're receiving the promise that God gave to Abraham. You see that? What did God tell Abraham? In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. How did God keep that promise? Because he sent his son, Jesus, who was a Jew, descended from Abraham to do what we couldn't do, and he, is, he died on the cross to pay for our sin on the tree. He became a curse for us so that we wouldn't have to bear it ourselves. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sends his Holy Spirit to do what? To bless Jews? To bless everybody, the whole world. The promise, the promise to Abraham is fulfilled, Paul says, by the Holy Spirit. So that, so that, this is what he says, what, what, is it? what did he say in verse 29? If you are Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. This is, this, you got literally, if you were Jewish, your mind would explode with what Paul is saying. Gentiles become Jews in the truest sense of a Jew. Not, I keep the law and eat kosher food, but I receive the promises of God by faith in Christ. By faith in Christ. By becoming in Christ. That's what he is saying. To believe in Christ is to receive the Holy Spirit because, the whole, because that is God's chosen means to, the, to fulfill the promise to Abraham. Through faith in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the promise made to Abraham. So now, now just think about that. The, you know, we think, oh, you know, Father Abraham had many sons, you know, and it's a Bible story, and it just seems like so far off. It seems so distant. It seems like what in the world does Abraham have to do to me, do with me? And I'm telling you that the, the, the words that Abraham heard in his ears when God told him, I will bless you, that very same promise is fulfilled in you if you have the Holy Spirit of God. It's not some far off theological abstract concept. You are Abraham's child if you believe like Abraham did. That's what the Bible is saying. That's what Paul is saying. It is the gift of God, it is the Holy Spirit. Jesus in John chapter 3 would go on to say, Unless one is born 
of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because the Spirit is the key. Faith in Christ, reception of the Holy Spirit, it is the Spirit that makes us children of God. It is the Spirit that makes us citizens of heaven. It's not, we should go to church, we should read our Bibles, we should, you know, profess Christ. But guess what? None of those things guarantee access to the kingdom of God. You have to have the Spirit of God, which is a gift that cannot be earned. It is received by genuine faith in Christ. And what does that mean? This is what it means. It means if you are Christ, then you are a child of God. If you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. That's what it means. And it's time, it's time that we as Christians, we as a church, begin to live as people who have God living inside of us. Right? We give ourselves too many excuses. We give ourselves too many easy outs when the Bible says that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be timid. We don't have to sin. We don't. Because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And it's all possible because we are Christ's. Okay, so I'm going to just, I want to I look at a few more important benefits of being a child of God. But to do this, we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So it's probably just one or two pages in your Bible, the next book over. Ephesians chapter 1, okay, verses 13 and following. So this is another key passage where the Apostle Paul talks about lots of the same truths. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, in him... In Jesus, you get that? In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So what does that mean? It means when we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, in Jesus, the Bible says we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So again, look at all that language. It's the same. Paul's mind is just saturated with this thought. The the Spirit was promised. God promised to give his Spirit. And that promise is actualized, that promise is realized through faith in Christ. When a person exercises genuine faith in Christ... They receive the Spirit of God. And that Spirit, he says, is, seals the believer. We are sealed by the promised Spirit of God, verse 13. Okay? So what does that mean? The, the, the word is kind of like down payment. Right? A down payment is the first installation. Right? It's the first installation. And it's not only that, but it's, it's a way of saying... It's a way of saying, here's, here's, here's this up front, and this also tells you that I'm good for the rest. When the Spirit seals us, God is saying, I'm giving you my power living inside you right now, and guess what? There's a lot more coming, and I'm good for the rest. We are sealed by God. We are sealed by the Spirit. We are set apart for God, empowered by God. Um, and, and promised by God that these are just the beginning of the blessings. The Bible says, I has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind can imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. It's the guarantee of what? What does it say there? Verse 14. It's the guarantee of our inheritance. Y'all know what an inheritance is? It's, it's something that, it's, it's, it's riches that you got waiting on you. There's, there, we have God, there are riches, there are riches that God has for us that we haven't even touched yet. That are coming for us, that are waiting for us, and it's guaranteed, our, our names are there, we're signed, sealed, because the Spirit is in us. It's there, it's coming, it's ours. 
Who receives the and who receives an inheritance from God? His children. His children. And we know we're his children by how? By the Spirit. The Spirit who has sealed us from him. So let's let's look a little bit further, see what Paul is saying here. Verse 15. This is um this is one of Paul's incredible prayers that he tells the Ephesians he's praying for them. This is what he says. Uh, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom, spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great mind. So that is super dense, but it's worth thinking about it, okay? The spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. It's the promise, it's the seal, it's the guarantee. And what does the spirit do? Paul says he's praying for them to do what? He says that the, that, that the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the Father of glory may give you a spirit, capital S. My Bible says capital S. I think that's the right translation. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see that? We're sealed with the spirit. I would say the spirit is the one who enables and empowers faith. And then the spirit is also the one who gives us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Now think about that. He's praying, you should pray this prayer. He's praying that God would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, right? The spirit. There are things about God that you cannot know unless God reveals them to you by his spirit. That's what he's saying. That's why he's praying that God would reveal to them by his spirit. I pray that God would give you the spirit. Let's pray for ourselves, for our church, that God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of God. There are things we can't know unless the spirit teaches us wisdom, unless the spirit reveals. That's what revelation means, right? There are things, revelation means it's hidden and then it's revealed, right? There are things we can't know because of our human limitations apart from divine revelation that God gives through his spirit. This is why, this is why some, this is why people out there, they just, you know, people look at some of the things we believe and just think it's so crazy and so backwards and so old fashioned and just doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't make sense because it only makes sense with the Holy Spirit. Without the spirit, it's not going to make sense. The spirit reveals it. The spirit reveals its truth. The spirit and we're going through, we're going through First Corinthians on Wednesday night. You know, uh, let me please come. It's so good, and Corinthians is so. They were so messed up, <laughs> and and so are we. And that's why it's so good. To, it's been so good to go through that book. But we're just in chapter one right now, and we're chapter two. And but Paul talks about how like the natural mind cannot apprehend the things of God because they are spiritually discerned capital S. The Spirit has to reveal them to us. Right? So, in other words, hear me now, this this shouldn't make us proud. The point is this, don't take your knowledge of God for granted. If you know Jesus, that's a gift of God. It has been revealed to you by God, by the Spirit. It's only because of Christ, it's only because we are Christ that we can know what we know, that we can be a child of God, that we can have a personal relationship with the God of the universe, that, that by the Spirit, we, that we can hear God speak to us literally by the Spirit because Paul says the Spirit of God will testify with our spirit that we are children of God, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. These are gifts of God because we are Christ. So the Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. The Spirit is the 
uh, gives us the wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of God. That's a gift of being a child of God. Let's look at another one. He says there in, uh, in verse 19. It says, it says that the Spirit also, the Spirit also empowers us to know what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great mind. Now just think about what God has done. God has created the entire universe with a word. He has worked out and is working out every detail in human history. Nations rise and fall according to the plan of God. Jesus said a sparrow in the woods where nobody is watching does not fall to the ground apart from God. He sees us. He knows us. He knows us in our deepest, darkest, and worst moments. And at the right time in human history, God sent his son into the world. He, God, the eternal son of God, added humanity to his deity. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And just as sin came by a tree, Paul says sin was undone by a tree. By Jesus hanging on a tree. To, because the Bible says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that Jesus could become a curse for us. To pay the penalty for our sin. And since the wages of sin is death, forgiveness of sin means eternal life. He obliterated death by his resurrection. He is now conquering the world by his gospel. And then one day Jesus is going to come back. And the Bible says every eye will see him. It takes the spirit to even scratch the surface of the immeasurable greatness of the power of God. To understand the working of his great might toward us who believe. These are gifts of the Spirit given to us because we are Christ's. There's one final thing that I want to mention about being a child of God. It comes from John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Because we are Christ, he knows us and we know him. As I said before, you know, I could walk up to the White House and knock on the door, but guess what? Unless the president walks out and says, I know him, it doesn't matter how much I say, I know the president. It doesn't matter how much you say, I know Jesus, if he shows up and says, I don't know you. And in fact, Jesus said that this exact thing would happen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we... Prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, there's this, well, I mean, there's a, there's a, they're worked into the human fabric of reality, to the fabric of reality is a strict binary. Either Christ knows you or he doesn't. Either you know Christ or you don't. When he comes back, there's only going to be one of two things he's going to say. He's either going to say, who are you? Or he's going to say, you are mine. The Bible says that when he comes, he's going to send his angels out to the four winds and gather his elect from all the world and gather them to himself. And Jesus, this is what Jesus said. He says, I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own. I know my own. He knows us. So that, that was, that's the question that boils down to. <laughs> and that, that perhaps is the greatest of all the blessings is being known by Jesus. To have him know you. You know, a shepherd, um, a sheep looks like a sheep to me. They're not, frankly, they're not that attractive. And they're kind of annoying, you know, the bleeding, you know, that. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Um, But you know what? To a shepherd, a shepherd is with his sheep. A shepherd watches his sheep. A shepherd never leaves his sheep. A shepherd knows his sheep. You know, I say that's a sheep. A shepherd says, well, that's Chad. Yeah, he's a sheep. He's kind of a stubborn one, too. But you know what? That's my sheep. That's my sheep. That one's mine. That's my sheep. I know him. He knows us and we know him. That's what it means to be a child of God. To belong to Jesus. You know you know Jesus and he knows you. You can't not know somebody when you're following them. When you have, when you have walked down the dusty road of life with him. And, you have, and he, has, he, has take, he takes these careful steps in dangerous places and you have to follow him. Lest your foot should slip. And then you get yourself in a mess and he has to turn around and get you out. And come after us in those dark pits that we wandered off into. And sometimes he has to whack us across the head with his shepherd's crook. Because we won't listen. Won't listen. So I tell my kids, you don't, you don't listen. But you know what? He does it because you're his. That's why he does. He says, that's mine. So that's what it means to be a child of God. Whose are we, church? We are, Christ. we are Christ's. And that makes all the difference. And if you don't know Jesus today, if you don't belong to him, You can. You turn from your sins. You look to Jesus who is alive and well. You turn from your sins and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Change me. I need you. Forgive me. He can say, come on in. Let's pray.